From these post-war streets emerged one of Britain's most successful companies. It's difficult to imagine that two brothers born in 1940 Salford would end up running almost 1,700 high street stores and employing over 10,000 people. This is the story of Betfred, the company founded by two brothers, Fred and Peter Doan. Salford was a working class area. We came from Salford 5 Odsall, which was considered one of the uh, rougher parts of Salford. Right in the middle of the slums. Although, if I said that, my mum had turned over in a grave. You know, she was a bit of a Mrs. Bouquet. And uh, she said, we don't live in the slums, but we did. But it was just a normal working class environment, a happy bringing up with the, with the other kids. Everybody was poor, but we were all in the same boat, but you didn't know you were poor. We didn't think it was tough. We didn't think it was rough. And looking back on it, it was a really good grounding for, you know, what's coming in the future. So, yeah, you just take it, you know, you're not used to anything else, so it's no problem. Just interested in playing football, going swimming, and the normal things that kids want to do, but happy. Leader of the gang. I hated school. It wasn't my forte at all. I wasn't academic, but I just couldn't wait to get away from school. Didn't have much re respect for teachers. Uh, I think it was just me. I was going nowhere at school. I just couldn't wait to leave. My dad was a bookie. He was an illegal bookmaker. In the 40s, during the war, he worked at a place called Metrovix in Trafford Park, which made armaments, uh, tanks and things like that. Uh, but his real forte was going around Trafford Park collecting bets. And there was racing, I think it was only on a Wednesday and a Saturday then. But he, even in those days, he was, he was doing okay for himself during the war. And after the war, he, uh, he worked on his own. And then eventually he, uh, he got skint. And the reason he got skint is bookmakers in them days earned it and spent it. And he went working for a Salford bookmaker, but also kept his own connection as well. So he was taking bets on his own behalf and working for another bookmaker. Um, and I got a great grounding and education from the old man about odds and how to take bets. And at 12 and 13, I was working for the old man at weekends, Saturdays and, um, and school holidays. But it was, a, it was a great grounding. My dad was not a businessman. The difference between me and the old man was that I became a businessman. But I was first and foremost a bookmaker and I've loved bookmaking and it really is in my blood. And I'm in many businesses now, but bookmaking is still my first love. Fixing the odds, I enjoy it. We always had a little bit of an entrepreneur streak in us. I can remember um, we used to sell shirts on the market, set up a little business. Didn't go very far, didn't last very long, but you know, I can remember Fred saying to me um, at one stage, you know, Pete, this time next year we'll be millionaires. I was always interested in money. You know, when, when they say that the light came on, the light came on with me when our next door neighbour told me about compound interest. You put £10 in the bank and you get 6% on it, so you got £10.60. Next year, you don't get interest on, uh, on £10, you get it on £10.60. And with that, it sort of fascinated me and I became very money conscious and I would do things like I would take bets to a bookmaker and he'd give me 12 and a half percent on the uh, on on what I took in there and I was getting a nice few quid for myself I also had my sweep which was always bet on uh, Salford rugby and I'd go around on a Friday night and I'd put 50 tickets in a hat they'd draw the ticket out and whatever ticket you drew out if Salford and the other team, you added the score together, so it was say it was 20, 21, you'd pay out on number 41. Any score above 50, you paid on number 50. So if it was 57, you'd pay on number 50 because you'd only sold 50 tickets. The trick was you kept number 50 for yourself. So that never went in the hat. So six, seven times a year, it, I'd be winning it for myself. And the embarrassment was, or it's an embarrassment you get over quickly. Who won it last week, they'd say to you, and you'd say, Mrs Corrigan at number 47. So, yeah, it was always about money. And um, 
When I left school, I left school with a thousand pounds at 15, which is an enormous amount of money. When, it, to put it in context, a working man would be earning 20 pound a week. The sweep, I was doing, I was probably eight, nine, taking bets to the bookmakers, eight, nine, because bookmaking, what, you know, you've got to be 18 to go in a betting shop now, but it's legal now. Then it was illegal, so it didn't matter what age you were going into the bookmakers, it was illegal anyway. So the bookmaker didn't mind. I wanted to be a draftsman. A draftsman, for people who don't know, is sort of an architect. And I lasted six months there, and I was useless at it, completely useless. I had no interest in it. It was a complete and utter waste of time, again. And uh, the opportunity came along to go and work for a bookmaker at 15 and a half. Remember, it was still illegal then. So I left the engineering company, and I can remember the personnel director saying to me the day I was leaving, it's the worst work, day's work you'll ever do. You're leaving a great apprenticeship. I was on £1.50 a week. And why did I go out in bookmaking? Not because I wanted to be in bookmaking, but I needed a job and I hated what I was doing. And slowly I got the bug for bookmaking. I enjoyed it. I, I, I used to enjoy pitting my wits against the punter or fixing the odds um, and making money. It was, um, and I've loved it ever since. I went in a betting shop at 15 as a board boy. By the time I was 17, I was a manager of a betting shop working for a company. You weren't even allowed in betting shops till you was 18 and I was managing the shop at 18. And I think that sort of a grounding gave us the, um, the strength really to, to push on. No Englishman will ever forget 1966. But for the Domes, it was a result which would change their lives. I had 200 pound on England at eight to one to win the World Cup. Um, that, was, that was a really, really big bet. My wife used to go to the uh, supermarket and get the full week's uh, groceries in for a fiver a week. So he's putting it in some sort of context with you. So that was a big one for me. I've been a punter um, and I've had some nice bets, but yeah, it gave me a leg up back in England to do it. Sometimes you have to take a risk. And it was, a, it was a great result for England. It was a great result for Betfred. I worked for this guy in Salford and I worshipped him. He was a guy called Ernie Peters and he was, uh, he was very good, very good to me. And uh, Ernie retired and I wanted to do things for myself. And I'd heard a rumour that there was a bookmaker for sale and the rumour turned out to be wrong. Um, but the bookmaker next to him came up for sale, a guy called Billy Fletcher. And I went to see him and I was terrified. I'd never done a deal in my life. And I went down on a Friday night, I said, Mr. Fletcher, I'm told that you're for sale. He said, I don't know where you've got that from. He said, but stick around till my staff have gone. And he started talking to me, he opened his books. He was very straight and very honest with me, showed me all the numbers much more than you would get with a normal business deal. It was very open. And he asked for £4,000 for the shop. I didn't have a hope in hell of getting £4,000. So I went to my in-laws, my mum, my dad, my brother, my wife, and we managed to scrape together £2,000. And I went back to see him on the Monday. I said, I'm sorry, Mr Fletcher, I've messed you about. I can't do the deal with you. So he said, why? I told him the reason, I couldn't raise the cash. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. It's been a family business. He said, I could sell it to anybody, this business, because it's a good one. I'll give you a mortgage for 2,000 pounds. He said, I want 10% interest. I don't want you to send me a check every week for 20 pounds. So we agreed a deal at that. So I paid him 10% interest. And my first job every Monday morning was to send a £20 check off to Mr Fletcher and he was as good as gold with me. And that's how it started. And when we took over the first shop, he had five staff on through the week and seven on a Saturday. I couldn't afford any of them. I couldn't afford staff because we had no money. I opened the bank account on, uh, on Monday morning at Barclays Bank with 75 quid and that was it. 
I can remember it clearly. Um, there was me, Fred, my dad. My wife was a, a part-time cashier with us. She'd come in in the morning, she'd come in all Saturday. Peter's wife, she'd come in on a Saturday as well. So it was a real family affair. What did I do? I was a sales and marketing director. Well, actually, I was a board boy. I was on the board, um, and I was, if you put it to a restaurant, I was front of house. Fred was the chef, he was doing the bets. You just mocked in, didn't you? You just carry on and do things. Couldn't afford um, to employ anybody, so I just put my yellow gloves on and off I went. Cleaned the shop, did the cashiers, and I got a very large sum of money. I got six pound a week for five days. Every day, literally every day, every week, in that, particularly in the first year, was a gamble. And um, we could have been out of business any time within that period. In fact, I'm amazed we've lasted 50 years. You know, the gambles we took in the first years, absolutely astounded that we're still around, you know, still here. You could only have the word licensed betting office on your windows, and it had to be no more than three inches high. You weren't allowed to see in the shop, the, the shop windows had to be blacked out. You couldn't put chairs or tables or stools <coughs> in the shop. A punter was supposed to come in, put his bet on and go out. It could not loiter. Of course, everybody ignored all that. Britain in the grip of the foot and mouth epidemic. All over the country, race courses stayed empty. Racing had been banned. Though expected, it still came as a severe blow to those dependent on the sport and up and down Britain, the scene was the same in hundreds of betting shops. Mainly the betting in those days, probably 90% of the business was horse racing. Well, foot and mouth came and um, they closed horse racing down for about four months. And what had happened, they'd just introduced afternoon dog racing. So we stayed open for dog racing and all the other bookmakers around me closed. And we, we took a lot of money you couldn't get in the shop. You, the shop was completely hammered because it took a while to build up. People weren't used to dog racing in the afternoon, but with no racing, they were gagging for a bet. And we were hammered, we were full, and we were making more money on afternoon dog racing than we were when we had horse racing. And the other bookmakers would say to me, how are you doing on it? I'd say, oh, it's very quiet, we're not doing any business. I didn't want them to open, so we got through foot and mouth and it was, um, it was very profitable for me, foot and mouth, so think out of the box. We had a fantastic business. The shop from three o'clock in the afternoon when the pubs closed was absolutely packed. Couldn't get anybody else in the door. Great atmosphere. And we'd come home and count the money on the carpet. We'd sit down and count how much we won and it was exciting. You know, we've won 44 quid today. Not bad, that. And it was good money. Incidentally, I doubled the turnover within the first nine months. Why? Opening up earlier, giving a service, giving the odds, taking a bit more risk, being a bit... a bit more adventurous than the normal bookmaker. So that's, that was the first shop in uh, Broughton Road in... Uh, well, we used to call it Cromwell Road. It's in Pendleton, Salford. Uh, I've had th people threaten me. Uh, I've had lots and lots and lots of that. that that's washed off a duck's back. Um, I had dockers coming to get me. One occasion where the commentator had called the wrong horse, he'd called the favourite the winner, and it wasn't, it was a 33 to 1 chance. And they were screaming at me what they weren't going to do, they were going to rip me to pieces. So the police were called, they threw everybody out of the shop, because the shop was closed, luckily. There was an occasion where, in the Guineas, Leicester Piggott rode a horse, and it was a nine to four on chance, and a guy sent 50 quid into my shop with another man. But he gave the other man the instruction, if it's more than two to one on, don't back it. Well, the guy didn't know, and he put it on. It was, it was nine to four on, four to nine, worse than two to one. Halfway round, they try and call the bet off. I just said, it's too late, they're running. He was thrown out of the shop by the police because he was causing eruptions there. So he said, are you the boss? So I said, yeah. Next thing, he throws a punch at me, which I ducked, and I had a fight with him in the, in the shop, scuffle. So the police were called again, he was thrown out again. 
6.30 at night, we were just locking the shop up. The knock came to the door. I went to answer it and he's there again at the door. He's got a newspaper in his hand. We used to have a, something called the football pink, give all the football results. Next thing, a knife comes out of the um, newspaper and he stabbed me five times. I, was, I had 32 stitches put in me. Um, my wife, she was on the counter, witnessed all this. To make things much, much worse, she'd bought me a new cardigan and it was ripped to pieces with the knife. But that day he got stabbed, I, I, I was frightened. I was frightened. Well, I was pregnant at the time. I was about two weeks after giving, giving uh, birth to our Peter, so yeah, it was frightening. He stabbed me just here. And the guy who stitched me up, the surgeon, said to me, another half inch and it had gone into your brain, you'd have been dead. Got the guy and he'd just come out of prison. He'd done four years for putting a, an iron bar over a guy's head and he got four years for me. And the day he came out, he phoned up, said he wanted his money back after four years. So yeah, there was some rough times that way physically. But you know, it's part of the business, you just get on with it, don't you? We never had a, a grand plan, but what we did do, we knew we could run businesses. We loved the challenge and we never stood still. We always looked to improve our business from the shop fit. Our shop fit was the best in them days, from the way we treated the customers. And we just kept moving forward and changing and, and, and never stood still. So we knew we'd always do okay. We never realized that, you know, it would be the business it is today, that's for sure. I'm not into grand plans. No, going into the business was about one thing, feeding the family and just having the ambition to do something for yourself. The second shop was a shop called Caddy's Head. I used to read the evening news back to front, look up every advert to see if there was any deals to be done in there, anything. Look, properties for sale. I told you I got the bug for, for earning. And I saw this shop for sale and me, my dad, and my brother, went down to see this guy and I did what I always do. I walked the course. You don't find betting shops from your car or from your computer. You walk the course, you see where the post office is, where the bus stop is, where the pub is, where the factories are, where the chimney pots are. That's how you, you do your development. So he said, look, 250 pounds, not a lot of money in anybody's terms these days. So I wanted a 250 pounds. I said to my brother, Go and lock the front door, put the snick on it. So I got a piece of paper out and I wrote a contract there and then. And I gave him a £20 deposit, £25 deposit, with 10%. So the second shot was Caddy's head and we bought it for £250. And we got the money back first week. So that wasn't a bad deal. I think we were always pretty confident because we knew the business inside out. We'd been brought up in the business. Fred and myself had been in the business since we were 15. And when we bought our first shop, I was 20, just coming on to 21. And uh, we were confident that we could run a betting shop. So we knew after we got the first one rolling in, got past the first 12 months, we knew very well that we could, we could grow the business. And we, and, we, and we did, you know, we took my, um, I went in the second shop to manage it. My sister went in the third shop. And then, you know, we run out of family, so we had to find staff, so. One of my weaknesses was that I never believed I should go more than 20 or 30 miles radius of Manchester. I was too parochial, too small-minded. And then an opportunity to came, uh, came along to buy uh, a shop in Liverpool, a place called Smithdown Road, near Toxteth, which, you, wasn't the most salubrious area in the world. And everybody said, don't go to the Scousers. They'll have your wheels, they'll, they'll wreck your shop, etc., etc." And we went to Liverpool and we bought this shop and we could run it. it. And it was a rough area, but we had no more trouble running Liverpool than we had running anywhere in Salford or Manchester. It was never a problem. And it gave us a little bit more confidence to think out of the box, out of Manchester. An opportunity came along to buy a group of 16 shops in Newcastle, or I should say the North East. We did the deal with them and I managed to get an area manager up there called Sue, and she was fantastic. She controlled everything for it. And it was the first lady 
area manager I had, it gave me the confidence to think if I can run Newcastle, which is 150 miles from Manchester, whatever it is, I can run Timbuktu. And, it, and then we went to the south coast, went to Devon, Cornwall and those sort of places. And then I put a development team together and all the boys on the development team came out of the ranks from betting shop managers, cashiers, betting shop managers. We would quite often get in the car, five o'clock in the morning I'd go and pick Fred up, uh, often drive to Scotland, we'd look at certain towns. At our peak, we were op opening 80 new licences a year. I mean, it was go-go in them days. This, these were fantastic times, and Fred imparted so much of his, his knowledge in the business on the team at the time. We made a few mistakes, and we got some wrong, but all in all, it was well worth doing, and um, some of those guys are still with me now. Next, how one jockey almost changed the course of history. He made the punters rich, and almost put Betfred out of business. 40 million pounds were lost by bootmakers. Moved the stock market, well, it was, was mad mental. Plus, why Fred decided not to buy his beloved Manchester United. It's one thing, opening shops. Now it was time to make a name for themselves. They needed something to stand out from the established brands of William Hill and Coral. And that's when he became the bonus king. But with big offers, there's always a downside, as they found out with Frankie de Tory and Fred's beloved Manchester United. He gives value in a different way to any other bookmaker. Whether they win or lose, there's no question you have had value. Because you don't always win even when you've got value, but you feel better about losing. And even the small punters, they love him because he gives the small punters a chance to make it rich. Whereas the big boys, if you win, away you go. One thing with Fred is he gives everyone a chance, whether you're a millionaire or whether you're skinny. He gives you a chance to win. And that's what the man's all about, value. Why would you want to come in my shop when you've been betting with Ladbrokes, Corals, William Hill for 10 years, 15 years? How did I get you out of their shops? I get, got you out by giving you a bonus. And that's how the moniker came, the bonus king. I used to give a bit back and I still do that. And probably my percentage, my gross percentage is 2% worse than anybody else's. I don't worry about that. I, that's been my hook getting you out of their shops. That's what's made us different. And we've introduced new bets. You know, we introduced the Lucky 15. Believe it or not, correct scores on football. I brought that out. I used to do it in a very small way. And I worked at fantastic margins, 10 times better than we're getting now. But when, you, when you're the pioneer and you can get away with that sort of thing, when it's, when it's established and it gets mature, you can't get away with it anymore. But I think that's what made us different. We thought, differently to the other bookmakers and we gave a service and we were good. Never worried about risk. I've always controlled risk. You know, there's, there's risk in everything. Any, any book sort of business that you want to open, there's a risk in it. And because if there wasn't, everybody would be doing it. I get things wrong. I've, I've opened businesses that have not worked where I've closed them down. But let me tell you this, I've paid everybody a pound in the pound Ne nobody has ever lost a penny with me. No bank, no investor. Everything's got to be above board. It's got to be straight. But yeah, there's risk, and I enjoy risk. That's part of the part of the crack. The 28th of September, 1996. Normal Saturday morning, I go in there and talk to the traders. I never forget. I thought it would be a nice, easy day. I'll be honest, I don't really remember that much. But you know, like like any normal big race mornings excited because obviously it was the Queen Elizabeth Stakes, massive mile race. We went big. I thought we'd just go there and it'd be, I only went with two grand in my pocket and that was what, what we called in London case money. The case is what, that's what you had, two grand. I opened the racing post, I went through my rides and just had a pretty good idea, you know, how 
the day was going to happen and what uh, strategy we used for each race. I came home, as I still do now, got home about 12 o'clock, bowler suit, that's my normal routine. In fact, it was a beautiful sunny day and I just lay on the bed watching the uh, racing. I thought, oh, must have been out the night before and had a few. You know, on the Saturday, we tried to get as, as many rides as we can. And I get a phone call, said, um, there's a horse running in this next race, one of Henry Cecil's, a horse called Mark of Esteem. 130 Mark of Esteem, 11 to 2 bar. And it was a tremendous horse, he had a tremendous turn of foot, acceleration, and uh, you know, I was nervous. We've got £20,000 in one single bet on it at 7 to 2. It will be interest for you. So I said, yeah. Just putting the phone down, and he says, oh, by the way, the Tory has rolled the first two winners. If it wins, it'll be no good in multiples. In a hundred yards left to go, Bosra Sham is grabbed now by Mark of Esteem. He's too good, the Colt, and it's Mark of Esteem who goes on to win the QE2 stakes. To me, it was job done, you know. I came to the races, won the first two, plus I won the biggest race of the day, Queen Elizabeth, and now, uh, you know, like you, you, you're on a high, you're, you're full of joy, and, you know, big smile on my face, and, uh, and off we go to race number four. Ben, for the first time in 20 years, I get a phone call. Can you come back to the office? Um, it's getting a bit out of hand here. So I knew if they asked me to go back to the office, it must be hot. And the phones were ringing off the hook. I think we had about 200 shots at that time. But all the lines were blocked. We just did not know. People could not get through. It wasn't computerized like it is now. So, the fourth one wins. I was still feeding of the buzz of the big race, so I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I don't really quite remember riding that race. But it's going to be four out of four for Frankie Dottori, as decorated hero goes on to win well by four lengths. Fred rang me and said, Pete, we've got a bit of a problem. Frankie Dottori's rolled four winners and you need to get down here because we've got a fortune rolling up. We don't know how much you've got rolling up. So the next thing is, Peter comes down to the office. I probably won four in a day, but to win the first four, in, I don't think I ever did. And it's gonna be five out of five for Frankie. What a day, faithfully gets there. So by the time I got down to head office, which is in worst at the time, the fifth horse had won. The phones are like crazy. We had absolutely no idea what our liability was. No idea. The shops couldn't get through to tell us. I don't even think the shops knew what the liability was. And I'm trying to keep calm in front of the staff. The last thing you want to do is show your nerve in any way. So you're putting on a face there. And my brother's pacing up and down like Felix the cat. We got ready for the six. Then I did start to panic. You know, not panic, but it really hit me. The understarted orders, they're off. Jesus, you know, this is... You know, I'm one away from equaling a record. You know, a record what is in 350 years is only done by uh, Gordon Richard, Alex Russell and Willie Carson to win six races in a day. It's six out of six for Frankie as Lock Angel gets there. But six one wins, now we're really in it. You can't cover because in the seventh race, we'd laid the horse in the uh, seventh race at 12 to one, that was the morning prize. I was still winning after five races because I was only playing small and then all of a sudden, the 6 one won, and I thought to myself, hang on a minute, there's a chance for you here, boy. Don't forget I was only a market trader, really, selling flowers in Level A Market in Oban. And I thought, this is my chance to be a millionaire. You know what I mean? And uh, the awesome question, Fujiyama Quest, was 20 to 1. And the first bet I laid was 40,000 at 4 to 1. Now, bearing in mind, 40,000, you've got 160,000 loss. I had two grand in my pocket. I couldn't believe it. This is how people were so stupid to back this horse that basically I thought it couldn't win because uh, it was out of form, top weight. But, you know, obviously it's my job. I have to go out there and try to win. So, But I, I absolutely had no pressure whatsoever. And once I took the first bet, you know, what you do? You just got carried away and I went on and on and on and on and on. And just as the, as the race was off, I admired my clerk who was with me and he, he was just, he couldn't move and he said, do you know what you're doing? And I never knew really what I was doing, I was just carrying, I just got involved in it and I had a loser for £1.4 million. 
the bell rings and you hear the crowd, all of a sudden the crowd screams and hits you, ah, and everybody's going mad. And all I could hear is just a lot of noise. We passed the two and uh, we got to the one and all I could hear is uh, uh, the, the, the crack of the whip of Pate de Rio, whack, whack, and I could, I could hear him coming. And uh, the horse is getting tired, I'm getting tired, now he's slowing down, he's coming to get me, the crowd is screaming. It's Fujiyama crest under top, weight a half in front, he's going to do it, Frankie de Tori, seven out of seven, it's a history maker, Frankie de Tori on Fujiyama crest. So all seven, so we know we're in the suit now. When that seventh horse won, we literally did not know whether we'd still be in business. It was a sense of disbelief, I'll be honest with you. You know, uh, I, I really didn't realise what um, I did. I never really hit at home and then on the Sunday, I went back on the Sunday and as soon as I went in to get my pitch, Sue Barker got me for the BBC. And, in, and on the morning of that day, everyone said that I was the villain of racing because all the big boys, the William Hills, the Labbrooks, the Coles, the bookmakers said, if it wasn't for me standing up against Fuji Armour Crest, the SP would have been even money. And I stood against, I stood up against it and the SP was two to one. Everyone went against me except one man. And that one man was Fred Doan, who really and truthfully, I never who knew who Fred Doan was. I was a southerner and Fred was pretty big up north, but you know, but not down south. Give the instructions to um, the shops. Do not leave the shops tonight until you phone your liability. We want to know how much you've got to pay out on on uh, Monday. And we didn't know whether it'd be a million or 20 million. We literally didn't know that we'd still be in business on a Monday morning. So we got the liability at half past seven and the liability that we still had to pay out on the Monday. Remember, we've got hammered on Saturday and we paid a lot of it out, but it was about two and a half million still to pay. We thought, we can live with that, we can handle it. There's so many people coming up to me, oh, I've won 10,000, I've won 8,000, I've won 50,000, I've won two people, one half a million, and people but with, with, with five pounds, two pounds, 50 Ps, I mean, it was like mad. We sent the video of all seven winners to all winning customers over 10,000 pounds. We sent them a bottle of champagne and a box of cigars, and there was one old lady in Salford who had a 50 P each way, seven timer, just an accumulator. And she drew, I think it was 35,000 for it. Didn't, know, didn't have a clue what she was getting. 40 million pounds were lost by boom makers. Moved the stop mark. I mean, it was, was mad, mental. Like. I'd done every penny I had. My house went, my cars went. It took me four years to pay back. I put up a photograph of Frankie Di Torre with the caption, last seen in the Ascot area. A reward, dead or alive, I don't care which. And it created a lot of fun with the punters and they showed that I wasn't a squealing bookmaker. And what did he do about the bonuses on the Sunday? Same again. And he never rode a winner on the Sunday. And what did we do? Within three weeks, I'd gone and bought three more bookmakers out because they'd gone broke on Detourist. People like Fred, who really stuck by me, it's just a gentleman and what, you know, he stood, oh well, for racing, it's choking me talking about it because, you know, when you're down, you need someone to look after you. And 20 years ago, he did. What? What they thought the impossible, it, it did happen. It's Fujiyama crest under top, way to half in front, he's going to do it. Frankie de Tori, seven out of seven, it's a history maker. Frankie de Tori on Fujiyama crest. Without risk, there's no opportunity. Keep doing it. If you ever watched the Busby Babes, you fell in love with football and they were the greatest team that I ever saw. Um, you know, I can recite the team now. I've never seen anything like Duncan Edwards and I still get a lump stuck in my throat when I think of Duncan Edwards. He was the greatest. I've got framed the first programme of when they, when they played the first match after Munich. And the United team has been written in in ink because they didn't know what the team was. And I went to that game. And that year we nearly won the cup. I went to Wembley and we got beat by Bolton. And Nat Lofthouse pushed our goalkeeper into the back of the net. Um, but yeah, my love for Manchester United will be there till my dying day. 
I had a box at Manchester United for nearly 30 years and I never ever went in the box myself because I don't believe that's football. I want to go and sit next to my brother in the stands and argue with everybody about football. That's what football's about. And uh, there's only one team for me and that's United. Always will be. A Manchester lawyer phoned me up. He said, Fred, I can't tell you who it is, but there's somebody in trouble and wants to sell his shares in Manchester United. He owns 25% of it. He's looking for £250,000. I thought about it and then turned it down because it was easier for me to put the £250,000 into buying new shops. And that was a big part of it. And you've got to think that football clubs, in the main, have never been about making money. It's been about burning money. Because most clubs do that. Um, but United have since become a money machine. But yeah, I had my chance to buy in a quarter of United for 250 grand. Do I regret it? No, because I, I don't live on regrets. Move on. Fred Doan is a gambler's dream. Two months of the footy season left to run and he's already stumping up cash to anyone who bet on Man United winning the Premiership. If you didn't already know, Fergie's men are 11 points clear with 10 games left. But remember what happened to Newcastle and their 12-point lead last season. It was about Easter time and I came home and I had uh, the usual bowl of soup on a Saturday and they played Chelsea and we walloped Chelsea at uh, Stamford Bridge. I thought, that's the season over, get paying out on it. And it wasn't about publicity. It was not about publicity. It was to say to punters, we're doing something different. I never thought of ringing a newspaper or TV or anything like that. So we paid out on them. And it cost us best part of a million quid. Why are you paying out all this cash so early? It's the first time in 30 years of bookmaking that I've ever paid before the results in. I think United have passed the post. Imagine the doomsday scenario for Man U fans. They're slaughtered by Monaco. Tired and dispirited, they come back. Sheffield Wednesday beat them on Sunday. Arsenal win their then three games in hand and then beat Man U. They're a point ahead. Now, I know that sounds impossible. None of the, of the pack challenging are capable of putting a string of wins together. But it, it is possible they could get beaten. But Fred in his heart so wants Man U to win. You're doing the best thing by your punters and you're a tremendous bookmaker, an independent bookmaker showing up the big boy. From the day I paid out on United, they couldn't kick a ball. They could not kick a ball. So, it went from bad to worse. But then the newspapers got hold of it. Within two weeks, I'd done 53 interviews. Mo wasn't very happy with me. I told him he was a nutcase. Absolute nutcase, he must be mad. We'd have Newspapers come to the house, I was giving interviews. We had newspapers from Australia, from Spain, from Canada, from the Canary Islands. We had television crews turning up from the BBC to ITV. It was probably worth it, millions and millions to us in uh, marketing. You know, even now, people say to me, oh, you're that nutcase that paid out on United, aren't you? Yeah, I am, yeah, I'm the nutcase with with your money in my pocket now. But yeah, it was great marketing for us. But I promise you, it was not contrived for publicity. It was a pure accident. And again, turning a bad situation into a good situation. What was Sir Alex Ferguson's reaction? Oh, it was very simple. He just said to me, don't you effing, and effing ever do that again on United. I said, I promise you I won't, but I have done it since. Let him run United, that was my philosophy. He can run United, I'll run Betfred. Taking on Ferguson is not for the faint-hearted, but what came next was even bigger. Renaming as Betfred, it was time to take on the establishment and become the biggest independent bookmaker in the world. By 2000, the company was at a turning point and about to open its first store in London. They thought it was also time to get into sports sponsorship like their competitors. But first of all, 
They needed to change the name from Doan Brothers. The very original business was Fred Doan. It started as Fred Doan. And then it became um, Doan Brothers. And then it became Dome Bookmakers, because Dome Brothers don't tell you what we do. We could have been undertakers or butchers, whatever we were. But in the two, early 2000s, the name change became because internet was kicking in. Um, people were putting the names on football jerseys. And you can't put Dome Bookmakers on a shirt, it's too big. And we never went to any marketing agencies or anything like that. There was nothing as sophisticated as that. One hang-up I had with it was this. It had always been Dome Brothers. It was me and my brother Peter. And I was a bit reluctant to go and take it to Peter to say we want to change it from Dome Brothers to Betfred. It was a great idea. It was a good thing because it was online was the main thing that was going starting then. And it made sense that the online should be in in line with the bookmakers in the betting shops and the retail so yeah it made sense to me we're the biggest sponsor of british horse racing we sponsor still over 600 races a year over six six and a half million pounds a year we've been spending in in sponsorship with british horse racing i mean everywhere fred goes there should be a a, a red carpet down waiting for him to greet him he's, he's a most marvelous man i think the brilliance i mean it's all right these big firms and whatnot but i mean he, he's he's a family to be reckoned with the Betfred Gold Cup at Sandown was the oldest established sponsorship. It used to be called the Whitbread. And it was a great, and we had some great times at Sandown, and the people at Sandown really looked after us. I had no problem with them at all. The anticipation. And they're off. The adrenaline. The action, the joy, the passion and the drama, the blood, the sweat, and the tears. They make the final turn in the Gold Cup. There can be only one winner. Betfred, at the heart of Cheltenham. Proud sponsors of the Gold Cup. The Cheltenham Gold Cup, that was the biggest. And uh, we got it, and I think, I think we did a three-year deal with a, a year's option. We took the option up. And then we sponsored it again. I, I think we probably did the, the Gold Cup for six years. Well, look what he's put into racing, the prize money. He's put absolutely millions into it, haven't they? You know, the Cheltenham Cup, when he sponsored the Cheltenham Cup, him and Mo was on the on the rostrum there giving out the trophy. It was politics that spoiled us with uh, racing and the, the Gold Cup. You know, uh, approved betting partners, I just didn't get my head around any of that nonsense. And I was about to renew our sponsorship with that. We had the contract, we'd gone right through it, everything was agreed. And then they brought this uh, approved betting partner out. And I thought, well, if they don't want my money, they're not getting it. And I just pulled the sponsorship. Betfred, celebrating 40 years of history at the Crucible. We are doing the snooker, the World Championship, that's been great for us. Him and Mo turn up every year, no matter where, no matter what's going on. He always says the same thing, I'm honoured to be the sponsor of this event. That's a word and a phrase that we don't hear very often. And we know it's genuine because he's been there for years and years and hopefully, please God, be further years and years more in the future. I get 17 days on BBC television. It's great for branding. I enjoy doing deals with Barry Hearn. Not, in, not the easiest guy to do a deal with, but you know, straight, once you shook his hand, we've got the deal. Fred is a unique character. Uh, he's, not, he's not a pushover, that's for sure. Fred's old school and, and I'm old school as well. So there's a good balance between us. I think we can both be stubborn and awkward and Fred Definitely he's got an A-level in stubbornness. But if he likes something, he closes, and when he shakes your hand, the deal's done. And for that, I'll always respect him. My big ambition is that a Chinese guy's going to win it one of these days because we'll have an audience of 300 million watching from China. We get regular audience, audiences from China of 10 million a day 
right throughout the tournament. So it puts the brand out there worldwide. And you know, when I, when I go on holiday, I go on holiday to the Far East quite often. And six months after the tournament's finished, you switch on TV and you see the Betfred brand over there. So these are things that we don't really know until we go out there and see it. It brings the feeling that he loves it and it's genuine. In my world, we take money from anybody. You know, call us what we ever are. We're a commercial animal. We go where the money is. Seldom do we come across someone that we can honestly say, and it does happen occasionally, this bloke really enjoys his investment in our event. As well as racing, Bet Fred became a high profile supporter of football. It was a partner of Manchester United and signed up as the first official betting partner at the new Wembley Stadium. Just last year, the Scottish League Cup was renamed the Bet Fred Cup. Passionate. 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 Bet Fred. Passionate about Super League. I can't say that uh, I brought Super League. Other people brought it to me and eventually went for it. If I'm honest with you, half-heartedly. But what I would say, it's been a great deal and we've got right behind it. And I love, I love being involved with the, uh, the rugby people. Why? Because they put themselves out for you. It's a partnership. All sponsorships are about partnerships. It's not a matter of writing a check out. If you write the check out and leave it at that, Believe me, you're wasting your money. You don't get value. You've got to keep working at it. And I've got good people at Betfred who work with our sponsors, but you've got to put yourself out there. I don't think there's ever been difficult decisions. Um, not, not in the bookmaking side of the business. Maybe in some of our other businesses, there have been difficult ones. Because when you are ability with bookmakers, nobody could tell us about bookmaking. You know, it's, it's in our fingernails. It's, um, and, and a lot of the things that happen to us uh, happen by accident. You know, opportunities came along and you'd weigh it up, make a decision on it and go and buy it or not. I mean, I have missed opportunities where I should have been bigger, but I'm not, but I don't worry about that. If I kick myself for a few things, um, one, I wasn't faster out of the blocks. Should have started uh, faster and gone for it quicker. But you look at, we've got 1,700 shops, so it's not that bad. Um, biggest opportunity we ever missed was we were slow at the internet. We were slow at the internet because, and I think my excuse for being slow at the internet, I don't think age helps you because the internet was about young kids. I mean, I understand what the internet's about now and about marketing and, and it works. But really, I've never been a pioneer. I've been an improver. You know, I'd see a business and go in and improve the business. Um, so we, we missed the first wave of the internet by probably five or six years. And, um, but we're catching up. We're currently building our own platform, which will be ready in probably 18 months. Um, and then we're gonna go gangbusters on it. Uh, we are making it pay. It's been a long struggle. The brand is out there. Everybody in the UK, everybody knows the brand. I don't have a problem with that. Worldwide, we still have a problem with it. But we are going to go for it. I've got some great people working for me. And I'm looking at the numbers daily and it's growing like tops. It, it will be a great business. I've been in the game for over 40 years giving you value. Is the all for Bookie making a huge payout? I'll give you great odds and fantastic bonuses. Doan, known to millions as Bet Fred, was racing's outside bet to take over the government-owned Tote bookmakers. After years of uncertainty, today he became the state-run company's new owner. Well, it's humiliating, first of all, for racing's rulers. The ruling BHA, the horsemen's group, the breeders, owners, traders, all went for this little consortium they got together under Sir Martin Broad. The man who got Hicks and Gillette out at Liverpool, but the government said no. The hard-headed businessman, Fred Doan, he knows his racing. I've looked at the tote. The tote was an unloved baby. It was, um, it'd been on the, the for sale block for probably five, six, seven years. And, uh, the Tories got in and within about nine months, George Osborne announced that he was going to sell the toll. Well, we'd heard it all before, haven't we? 
And really, if you think about it, the government had nationalised water, electric, gas, British Airways. Why did they want to be bookmakers, the government? It was ridiculous, it was stupid. And my finance director at the time came in to see me and said, are we buying the tote? So I said, I'll tell you what we do. If two and two make six and we can get the money, we'll buy the tote. So we worked it out with the synergy savings. We saved over 25 million a year by just putting the two companies together. The tote itself wasn't making a lot of money. So it didn't make any sense for outsiders. It had to be uh, a player already in the business to make it pay. Literally, when he came to me and said, we were going to buy the tote, the conversation lasted 15 minutes and I just said, go ahead and do it. We've always backed each other 100%. We've got, you know, when it comes to business, we've got incredible relationship, there's no doubt. There was 20 runners in the race. Most of them no hopers or, what, what's the phrase, tyre kickers. Now, it came to two runners, me and a guy called Sir Martin Broughton. He was chairman of British Airways and he wanted it to run it for his son, completely the wrong reasons. And let me tell you, I've done him a favour not letting him win it, that we got it. Why? Because within two years it had been back with the banks, they would not have made it, but it was a nine months battle. And politics came into it, which wasn't nice. We weren't buying a normal business, we were buying a business off the government. It was a hard fought battle, but we eventually won. And we turned it around, We've, we had to do a lot of cost cutting, uh, made redundancies, but there's more people working at the combined company now of Betfred and Tote than there was before we bought the Tote. And everybody says, um, I got it cheap. Believe me, I didn't get it cheap. We paid 265 million for it, um, which was market price. Why did they say I got it cheap? Because Corals, a couple of years before, had bid 400 million for it, didn't get it. So that 265 looked cheap in comparison. Well, if it was cheap, why didn't Corals buy it? Because they had their opportunity, they were in the bidding for it, and they dropped out. They never bought it. When he bought the tote, he got the tote out of a lot of trouble, you know, when he bought it and he'd done the jackpot, he's given the scoop six, the bonuses and that. And do people give him credit? Absolutely no. I, I think the normal people give him credit, but not the big boys, because the big boys, I don't think they love a winner. And Fred is a winner. Yeah, I'd do it again tomorrow. In fact, I did it just before last Christmas. I bought 322 shops off Ladbrokes and Corals. Would I do it tomorrow? I'd do anything tomorrow, providing the price is right, providing the business case is right, and it's logical. Yeah, I'd buy it again. Chelmsford Racecourse was run by a guy called John Holmes, who, in my opinion, got a very, very bad deal in life with the way he was treated by banks. It had raced 40 times and then it closed down. It had no grandstand. It had been valued at 38 million before the recession came in. And I was able to go and negotiate a deal with the banks and I bought it from the banks. We then built a grandstand, which cost us probably in the order of about 12 million pounds. We did it with our own money, no levy money, no bank borrowings, nobody had lent his money on it. We had to do it out of all our own cash, which we did do. It's now operating, we, I think next year we've got 63 meetings. Um, we've got a nice grandstand there. Everybody who goes says they love it. And we get all the best trainers there. We had to relay the track, at the cost of about half a million pounds. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great adventure. 50 years since opening the first store in Salford, Betfred now has nearly 1,700 stores in the UK and employs 10,000 staff. But what of owner Fred Doan? Is he still as hungry as ever? 50 years in business, how does it feel? I've enjoyed every minute and I still love it. The story of Bet Fred is intrinsically linked to Fred, who still has his name on the door. The question is, after 50 years, what still drives him? It's working all the time. Because it's not getting any hobbies. 
other than the gym or you like reading. But I mean, how much gym and how much reading can you do in a day? You know, and it's not good at doing any jobs, are you? Not useless. But you know, work is not work to me. Work is my life. It's my pleasure. Um, I enjoy it. I mean, the reason I still I don't work for money. It's a bit. Uh, I work because I like working with the people. I like challenges, and I like. Uh, I like the future and I like the development of all sorts of businesses. I mean, this morning I came down at quarter past five, seated the cats, emptied the dishwasher, made more cup of tea, set, take it upstairs to her. And then at uh, quarter to seven this morning, I was in the gym putting it in. After this, I'm going to get in the car and I'm going down to Media City and I'm on uh, Betfred TV. Best. Best hour of the week when I get on uh, Betfred TV. Why? Because I'm not talking to my accountant, my lawyer or advisors. I'm just talking to the punters and that's what I enjoy. I love the punters. Up for it today. I'm up, really up for it today. Most of it is not scripted. We just get on with it and do it ad lib. It's not accepting me pass. I've got the wrong one, that's why. I thought I saw it 9 to 2. Forget the 9 to 2. There it is. Six to one, you can have Uptown Funk in this race at Sprint Valley. Getting back to it, Mark, brilliant. Every bit of it, push, push, push for 50 years. King pusher. You know, if you look at some of the chief execs from the other big companies, Willie Mills, Ladbrokes, Paddy Power, etc., uh, etc., et none of them have gone through this because they've not come through the shop floor. And I do enjoy it. And it's not about the money, it's just keeping in touch with people. If you've got anything about you, the last thing you want to see is problem gamblers. I don't want to see broken families. That Nobody wants any of that nonsense. So I say every week, I say the same words, maybe in a different format. Keep it fun, keep it friendly, bet responsibly, bet to your pocket, nobody gets hurt, hurt and we all have a good time. I'll say that till the uh, last show, always. Absolutely 100% proud to be a British bookmaker. You know, we went legal in this country in 1961. The punter in this country gets the, the best deal, the best protection. Shops have still got a good life in them. Uh, I believe it's there. You've still got to work at it. You've got to work every day at it. The bigger business is going to be online because I look at our numbers every day. We're growing like topsy with the internet. Um, yeah, I think it's got, a, with, with the exception of, of one thing, what government do, a lot of it is in their hands. Now, how do I see the industry? I see a great industry paying taxes and looking after people, providing we don't get interfered with too much. I'm involved in 16 different businesses. I suppose the biggest business out of uh, Betfred is a business called Peninsula Business Services. I take no credit for that. I was um, part of the seed capital with it. My brother runs it. And our accountant advised us to get out of it, sell it, stick to what we know. So we said, look, somebody needs to give it six months, literally needs to give it six months to see whether we've got a business or not. And we literally, Fred and myself, tossed a coin. I won and Fred said, you got a peninsula. And that's how it turned out. Six months has turned out to be 20, 25, nearly 30 years. If we go back to when I first went into the business on a day-to-day -day basis, we had 12 employees and 50 clients. That's after three years. So you can see what a disaster it was. Today, we've got over 2,000 employees worldwide, over 60,000 businesses subscribed to our service. Uh, we're in the UK, we're in Australia, New Zealand, and next month, October, we open up in Canada. He invests a lot of money, which people don't see, in young entrepreneurs and things like that, and giving them a start. And he wants them to do well. And I know that's genuine, because you don't read about it in the papers. It's something that's personal to him. Fred's legacy is the ability to say, why not? I can do it. I've been fortunate enough to be with him for 24 years. Well, I started in 1994 as a shop manager. I then moved into the development team in 1998. I subsequently then headed up that team for a number of years. And then three years ago, I was appointed the retail managing director. Fred has a habit of finding young 
raw talent, developing them, educating them, passing his business acumen on to them. He nurtures personalities and, and passion and he's done that with, with all of the people I've seen with. And I've, I've done the same with, with my team as well. It really breeds into the ethos of the company. I was actually in the shop working and the regional manager came in. I was moaning about the quality of the marketing. It was pretty poor at the time. Then he said, why don't you come up to head office and we'll have a word with you. And then a couple of weeks I had a phone call saying, do you want to come and work for us? Um, they brought me in as a consultant, which was slightly odd as I was 23 years old and hadn't done anything in my life. I love startups. I wish I was younger to do uh, some startups again. But you know, the opportunities come along and you back the right people. And that is part of the excitement of, of it. He's very supportive and I think he'll give you as much support as you need. Fred always said to me, is Andy, when things are going well, uh, I, you don't need me. It's when, it's when things are going badly that you really need me. And that's, that's true. If I've got uh, any, any kind of problem, you know, day or night, I know I can, I, I can ring him. Um, and he, you know he's there to help, and he, no, nothing's ever too much trouble. Um, it's just he's just a huge support. Um, you know when when uh, think you know I think things are um, aren't going well, and it's probably at a very sort of small low low level. I can go and speak to him, and he can give me. He, he really he's really good at setting the big picture. Uh, and you know when you're sort of at the at the coal face, you you, may, you maybe don't see that. I've never really had difficult decisions to make. I think when I've made a difficult decision and I've walked away from it, that's the hardest thing I would say, walking away from a deal. Because you get G'd up for it and sometimes you get carried away with bid fever. But, but sometimes it take, you have to be stronger to walk away from a deal than, than actually do it. Well, that can be difficult. And we've walked away from deals and you look back and you think, we were wrong. But there it is, get on with it. The day I retire is the day I die. I enjoy doing everything in all the businesses that we're in. Bookmaking is still my first love and I don't, I don't envisage retiring at all. Why would I want to? I'm enjoying myself too much. I did a long time ago, I said, why don't you sell? But he just, no, he'd never, he'd never retire. What would he do? He'd drive me mad. Keeps me motivated. I think that's quite easy, it's certainly not money. Um, it was money early doors, but that's just the way of keeping score now. What keeps me motivated? Working with good people, running a good business, a slick business. I don't like, nobody enjoys running a business that loses money, but it's working with people. And you know, I've got some great people working with me, some great teams. That's what keeps me going, keeps me motivated. I haven't actually told this story to anyone, but I will tell you that I will tell you when I was working on the BBC, I got up to 37 stone in weight and I was struggling. I was really ill. I was in Solio Hospital in Birmingham. I was practically dying. I had diabetes, cellulitis, I had everything. And the nurse came in, I think it was the sister, and she said, uh, you've got to get ready in the morning by 8.30. It's only we've got a private ambulance taking you to the private hospital in Birmingham and I said what for and she said uh, you're going to have a gastric sleeve operation to lose the weight to lose 15 stone in one operation and I said no love you got the wrong person and she said no it's been paid for the operation by some... and I said no you've got the wrong person because really and truthfully I never knew that a person could do that for someone else and I said who is it and she said, Fred, down. And that day, I got in the ambulance by stretcher the following day, and you imagine putting me on a stretcher. That was the hardest job, getting me in the operating theatre. And uh, I had the operation. I'm here now, 15 stone lighter, and I'm alive. And I've still got my kids, and it's, without Fred, it wouldn't have happened. The man saved my life. Sorry. Anyone else want tea? No, just two of us. 53 years. <laughs> 53 years, yeah. And, we've been know, together 57, haven't we've been, we? Yeah, we've been together for 57, but we've been married for 53. And I wish it could go on a lot, lot longer. I hope it does. Yeah, yeah. She was going out with a boy, one of my best pals called Barry, and he uh, brought us to my house and uh, 
I've always said, she chased me. I never did. You, you chased she, me. She chased me. No, that's wrong. And the first night I went with her, we went to uh, to the pictures, to the cinema. Do you know what it's called? And the, was it the Regent? No. Nope. Uh, anyway, we went to the pictures and that's how it started. How did Barry feel about it? He wasn't bothered. He was, no. <laughs> I think he was too glad uh, to get think, rid of me. I think he got the best of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> he got binned. He got binned and uh, what a result he had. We're working class people. Mo likes to see her money in a, in a post office bank account. She's got no great ambitions. She just wants a family life with her kids. Yeah. 100%. I get up in the morning, the washing's in, the bed's made, I've had a shower, I've got made up. Ten past nine, I'm out to Tesco or wherever I'm going. Come back, prep the tea. So yeah, it's just yeah, normal yeah. daily just a normal life. Family. And we've got a good family. Got good kids. Yeah, all close to us. They all live. I think within P Peter lives ten miles away, but the rest of them live within the with the mile step. within a mile from here. Sunday morning, what's that like? Oh, it's it's well, if they're all here, about nineteen. Nineteen of them. It's chaos. And they all go and now they all come in here, cups of tea, toast, toys all over toast, the place, toast, tea, yeah, biscuits, crumpets. crumpets. Yeah. Yeah. And then when they've gone, we spend half an hour cleaning up, don't we? Yeah. Excuse me. Can I call you back, please? I'm just with people. I could be in the middle of a conversation and his phone goes and he walks out. By the time he's come back, I've forgotten what I was going to tell him. <laughs> so I've given up. <laughs> Right, I arranged those phone calls so I can go out so I don't have to listen. One thing I don't like about people is if they give you a hard time, I'm on the, I don't like that. Because he's, he's such an honest person, if he says something, he keeps his word. And if anyone, let's say somebody writes an article in the paper against him, I, it gets my back up. I'm a bit like that. She's too sensitive. The, uh, I've learned to live with that, and you learn to live with it most of the time. And what I find is, 99% of cases I don't reply to, maybe the odd 1%. Reason, people are entitled to an opinion, and you know if you're doing it right, you're doing it right, meaning morally you're doing it right. Um, and, and we are quite moral people. We've got a good family. We've got all the all the all the nice things in life. Nobody can want any more than we want. We just want our health to to remain as it is, mm. and keep doing what we're doing. We're happy with it. I don't think we've changed, have we? No. We still do things together. You've got a bit older. So have you. <laughs> so the legacy is more one of inspiration. Hey, look. Little fella from Manchester, started off small, got massive. How did he do it? Grafted his nuts off, that's how he did it. That's the legacy. He's affectionately known as the Bonus King. So in essence, he has been the punter's pal. He's built the business on offering value to all his customers. But on the flip side, I would also say that Fred dared to take on the establishment, the big three as they're affectionately known, Labrooks, William Hills and Corals and has succeeded to the degree that he is now one of the big three. I think the fact that they're just so down to earth and passionate, you, you just always feel the passion in this company. You know, we don't always make the right decisions, but our heart's always in the right place. For me, like the legacy is, you know, Degree 53 and all the other businesses that have sprung off the back of it. And, you know, we're, you know, we started off with one client, Betfred, and today, you know, we've got, we're working with clients all over the world. Um, and you know we've got 70, 71 people in here. Absolute gentleman, absolute gentleman. He's been absolutely great for our charity, the Injured Jockeys Fund. He's, he's the most generous man you can imagine. It's been a fantastic ride, a fantastic ride. I've loved and enjoyed every single minute of it and uh, I wouldn't change a thing. I never think about legacy. I never think about legacy. I hope uh, I hope my kids turn around and say he looks after us. And, uh, and a few people that I do look after, I think, well, you want such a bad fella. That'll do me.